Western Teacher Live, talking about public education, unionism and much more. Hello and welcome to Western Teacher Live. I'm Bob Fig. We are dedicating this episode of the SSTUWO's podcast to the Australian Education Union's national funding campaign for every child. I'm delighted to have two special guests with me, National President of the Australian Education Union, Karina Haythorpe, and Matt Jarman, President of the AUWA branch, the State School Teachers Union of WA. Welcome, Karina, and welcome, Matt. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Now, we've talked about public education funding before on this podcast, but for new listeners, we face an extraordinary situation where Western Australian public schools educating 72% of primary students and 66% of secondary students get just 91% of the minimum funding it requires, according to the Schooling Resource Standard. Karina, this unacceptable level of funding is what For Every Child has been established to address. So tell us a little about the campaign. Thanks, Bob. Well, there's a fundamental issue at stake right now, and that's the right of every child uh, in our nation to attend a fully funded public school. That means delivery of uh, 100% of the schooling resource standard, which is the minimum benchmark. It's not an aspirational benchmark. It's the minimum benchmark that all governments have agreed to with respect to the cost of educating a child. So the For Every Child campaign is about uh, making sure that the Albanese government delivers on their commitment to put all schools on the pathway to 100% of that. And uh, for Western Australian schools, that gap right now is worth around $519 million by the end of this year. It is an extraordinary situation with the private schools um, getting their funding at 100% or in some cases even more. Um, We don't go down that path because it was turned into a culture war a few years ago and that's partly why we've ended up here uh, in this situation. So, So Matt, just to clarify that, I know that this is not about taking funding away from private schools. Whatever people may think of that as a separate issue, this is only about funding for public schools. Yeah, that's right, Bob. The private school agreements are tied up until 2028-29. We're not even getting engaged in any private versus public conversation here. This is about public school students. This is about the 98% of our public school students across the country who are underfunded. And here in WA, they're reaching around about the 91% level versus the 100% level. There's not a private school here in WA, as I stand here this morning with you, that's not at 100 Some are up to 107% of the SRS. So the gap is enormous. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, Karina, WA on election day, the federal election, um, delivered four seats um, or four new seats uh, to WA, to the Labor Party and in effect gave them power. Um, so presumably those MPs, particularly in, in a couple of these marginal seats over in Western Australia, are, imp- are quite important to this campaign, you would think? That's uh, absolutely correct uh, in terms of their capacity to influence what's happening with respect to the Albanese government's commitment. Uh, we've got uh, also the members of the Expenditure Review Committee, which is the committee that essentially has the keys to the treasure chest here. Uh, and so as part of our national campaign, we're also uh, looking at uh, having conversations with all of those members um, to make sure that they understand the importance of fully funding uh, all public schools and the impact that that will have not only for teachers, but most definitely for our students with their learning outcomes. And uh, we've discussed in the past, Matt, that the issue here in WA, where, strange as it may sound, WA should be getting 105% of its funding because of the special needs uh, or requirements that in some areas of the state, particularly remote and regional areas. Um, we've also seen this 4% of, of additional funding, or what used to be additional funding, rolled over into the state government's commitment. So we end up on 91% now instead of 105%. How important is it to get it back up to at least 100%? I'm really, I'm really glad you recognise that the original Gonski funding had WA and the Northern Territory at 105%. And that was pre- predominantly because they recognise the geographical challenges that we have in WA, which is effectively a lot of schools in a lot of very small towns. And that's where the 105% came from. In WA, the 4% is skived off for capital 
capital depreciation tax, whatever that may actually be, and also to pay for some of the regulatory authorities, most notably SCARSA, which is, of course, a regulatory authority, which is gold standard, but it's also used across all of the education system here in WA. So the independents, the Catholics and the public school system, it's just that the public school student is paying for the SCARSA as a regulatory authority, and that's something we think that should be taken back to the whole of government and paid for for all people out of the same bucket and our 95% gets left alone. And uh, I think significant too for if you're uh, listening as a parent for example, if your kids are at a public school and they're going off to swimming lessons and things like that, that f- the, the payments for the buses to take your kids used to be funded as an additional payment, they're not anymore. That's all been rolled in to that funding. Um, and I know that we've got some great support out there in the community. I think 200 members attending the Wacos uh, conference at the weekend signed up for the uh, For Every Child campaign, which is a handy time for us to tell people who are listening. Corinna, how can they show their support um, for the For Every Child campaign? Well, the time is now in terms of showing uh, support. We've got the federal education, uh, sorry, the federal budget will be delivered uh, uh, early next year. Uh, and to apply the community pressure that's needed to get the Albanese government across the line in terms of the dollars, uh, we need every person to join us at foreverychild.au. Joining us means that you're simply showing your support and we're able to include you in the number of community uh, people that we take with us when we go to Parliament sometime in November to meet with the Prime Minister to say that we've got hundreds and thousands of people in Australia who believe that this is a critically important issue and that it should be a top priority for um, the Albanese government next year. And people have talked about uh, amounts. I know the national estimate, Matt, is $1,800 every single year for every student in public education. You're a former primary school principal. What would you be doing with that extra $1,800 per child per year if you had access to that and were were back in your school? Well, during the campaign day today, we're visiting three uh, large metropolitan schools and collectively they fall just short of $10 million. In my primary school, smaller class sizes, small groups for tuition, whether it be for early years literacy and numeracy intervention would be a priority. But in a secondary space, that might be tuition classes to help students in their secondary pathways achieve what it is that they're there to achieve for their life goals. The list of what we could use that sort of money for in a school really need is very exhaustive and long. But that decision really needs to be made by those students, sorry, by those staff at that school who best know those students. And of course that's the beauty of it, it gives them that freedom to make those decisions that, that suit their local needs. Correct. And the private school money is not conditioned, it is not tethered. And we would ask that the public school leadership and our curriculum leaders in our public schools also be backed in and trusted to, to know the students and to allocate those funds to best meet the needs of the students. And, and Karina, we're in a situation fairly unusually in Australia at the moment where we've got state Labor governments in, in all of the, the, the major states. Um, we have a state federal government. We have a federal education minister who has been pretty open about saying, using the word pathway to, to full funding. You would think this is probably the best opportunity that people have to win this fight, which, which would benefit every child who goes to a public school in, in Australia. There's never been a better time to deliver on the promise that was outlined by the original Gonski Review in uh, 2011, and that is that every child should be able to attend a fully funded public school uh, and that every child should have access to a high quality education regardless of their background or, or circumstances or indeed where they live. So we're asking governments to work together Um, to achieve this. This is the moment in time now that we can ensure that all schools are fully funded uh, and um, to do anything less will actually be uh, of great detriment not only to our students but to uh, the incredible teaching profession that that, uh, caters for their needs every day. And some of the rhetoric at the national level has involved commitments to um, reforms and and particular ways or, or measurable achievement levels. One of the things we're looking at here, Matt, very much is class sizes. Um, and that seems to tie with the smaller group um, theory that the minister, the federal minister talked about a lot about having small groups for improving literacy and numeracy, that sort of thing. Take us through why class sizes are important. Well, here in WA, when 32 students were put down as a, as a class size for years 4 to 10, it was 
30 to 40 years ago, the students you have in your classroom now are completely different in terms of challenge and what their needs are to what we had all those decades ago. So we need a responsive class size so that teachers can effectively deliver to those students in the best way that they know they can. Effectively, the class sizes are hampering their efforts and not allowing them to be the professional teacher they know they are. Parents are frustrated by that. Parents understand why class sizes need to be addressed again. It allows our teachers the best opportunity to transfer the curriculum and to look after those students who have differentiated needs, whether they be disability, complex learning needs or whatever the case may be. At the moment, we are simply asking far too much of our teachers to individually address in such large class sizes, which, by contrast, to every other state and territory in the country, we are either the highest or we are at the highest level. So smaller class sizes are a priority for those two reasons and they really do need to be redressed as a priority. We've already seen a generation of students go through the public school system without this kind of funding support. So as Karina says, there is no other time. This is the time to get behind the campaign and to make sure that every student who goes to a school receives 100% of the minimum minimum expenditure required for them to meet their expectations. Uh, and Karina, we, we've mentioned about special um, requirements in Western Australia because of the geography, because of the remoteness of some schools, of regional schools, Schools, etc. We've already seen some positive news for the Northern Territory in that sense, and I think it was a, an extra 40 million in funding. Um, can you explain how that helps in an area like the Northern Territory, and would presumably also help in remote communities in, in the north of Western Australia? Yes, this was a, a small allocation that was made in the last federal budget. Um, it uh, benefits uh, around uh, 36 uh, public schools in the Northern Territory in Central Australia. And uh, I actually had the chance to meet a, a principal of one of those schools last week when I was in Darwin and he was at a leadership summit and he talked about the $300,000 that's coming um, to his school, uh, life-changing funding that's going to be used for their dual language program for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, uh, life-changing pr uh, funding that will be used to invest in uh, additional teachers and also Aboriginal education um, support personnel uh, for that school. Now, we want that to be available for every school right across the nation, not just a small group of schools in Central Australia. And it seems to, to be a logical thing. If you've got communities with similar issues, then, then similar solutions would be welcome. Uh, Matt, the impact broadly on, more broadly on teachers um, in terms of, of workload, of the stress that they face, their own personal well-being, the collision between work demands and family demands, how is this level of or lack of full funding impacting on, on teachers? Well, teachers have been asked to do far too much for far too long now, and the list on the plate doesn't seem to get any smaller. And the consequence of that is we're losing our most experienced teachers earlier and the leaving to other industries. We've now got a teacher shortage crisis across the country. Here in WA, I am really not aware of any school that doesn't have a vacancy that needs to be filled. Some of our um, senior high schools and larger primary schools have got multiple vacancies, and they've had that now for more than 18 months. So the teacher shortage and crisis is being driven by workload to some extent. It's also being driven by school violence, but we think we're addressing that and we back the Minister's position around that. But right now it is around workload and we are asking far too much. In terms of what it looks like for a teacher, many of our teachers have reported to us through formal surveys. They don't get to see their kids play sport anymore on the weekend. They've got too much work to do. They've got hours and hours of external professional learning commitment with external providers that they've got no choice but to be signed up to. All of these things are just seeing them leave the profession. And then there's the lack of respect. So when you put it together from the perspective of the teacher, I can understand why we're leaving the profession in the droves that we are. I'm most concerned that we're losing the most experienced people. But at the other end of the scale, the research and the numbers show we're not attracting enough people into education either. And that comes back to the respect and what's happened to the respect of the profession in WA. And of course that, that, that about teachers is vital, but of course school leaders too are facing, they're getting dragged back into classrooms to, to fill gaps, to act as uh, relief for, for uh, teacher vacancies. Um, the pressure on them when you can't hire specialist STEM teachers, for example, it's also uh, causing a lot of issues for school leaders. Uh, our school leaders are teaching effectively now. It's wrong to think of our school leaders as people who are up in the office administering the school. Our largest school leaders are part, part of the timetable on a weekly basis. Our heads of department 
are not getting their administration time for the year 11 and 12 subjects. They're covering other people's classes. And in the office, we regularly hear of schools reporting that they've got classes that were missed on that day because they just weren't able to get a student, so the classes were combined. The teacher shortage crisis doesn't seem to have an end at the moment, so we need this funding to come to the forefront so that we can attract some of those registered teachers who are there in the community back into the profession and hopefully start to stem some of that shortage crisis. And, and Karina, I'm sure you're hearing similar stories right across the country. Obviously, we look at it from a Western Australian perspective. Presumably, you're coming across these same issues right across the country. There is a national workforce crisis, and it's. Uh, I, I think if I use some figures from our um, State of Our School survey, which we run across the nation, in 2015, we had 28% of principals tell us that they had a teacher shortage uh, in their school and didn't have enough teachers for their classes. Unfortunately, the latest survey uh, says that 90% of principals are now in that position in terms of not having enough teachers to um, put in front of classes. So there is absolutely no doubt that it's a, a, a crisis at foot and the, the way to resolve this is not only to properly resource uh, all of our schools so that we can attract and retain more teachers, but it's also to look at uh, the issues around initial teacher education and making sure that we are supporting student teachers to complete their courses and providing them with mentoring and uh, proper induction processes when they enter the profession so that they don't leave within the first three to five years. And so uh, you can hear that this issue of funding reaches right across all elements of uh, public school education. Uh, and uh, as we've said, if you wish to help um, with that situation, we would love you um, to join us in that fight. You can go to www.foreverychild.au or if you're in WA and you want to go that way, you can go to our website, sstuwa.org.au. Search for Every Child and you'll find a hub there with all this funding information. There's some fantastic information booklets from the AU, there's some localised West Australian information and of course the ability to sign up. So I've been delighted to have on the Western Teacher Live two presidents, uh, the uh, president of the Australian Education Union, Corinna Haythorpe, and Matt Jarman, president of the AUWA branch. Been like an episode of the West Wing for me, surrounded by so many presidents. So thank you both for joining us and uh, have a good day, busy day ahead um, and uh, hopefully a lot of success coming for the Every Child campaign. Western Teacher Live, cutting through noise on public education and union issues.